We're going to jump right in because we're continuing in our story as we work through the great narrative story of the Bible. And in last week's um, time together, we talked about King David, well, King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. And King Solomon, as we heard at the end of last week, was actually doing great. It was a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity and success for the nation of Israel. And this actually came, remember, because um, Solomon had the opportunity to ask God for anything, and he chose wisdom. That's what he asked of God, and God gave it to him so much so that we learned the Bible said no one ever was like him and never has been like him ever since. He was unique in his wisdom and his ability to govern mankind, and so God blessed the nation. He blessed them in so many different ways, but Solomon had stopped applying that godly wisdom to a key area of his own life. You ever heard the analogy about a frog dropped into a pot of hot water? If you put a frog into hot water, he just hops out. But if you put a frog in cold water and then turn the heat on, and the heat slowly rises, the frog will stay in until he actually dies. As long as the heat changes gradual, he won't leave. And this is what happened to Solomon. Solomon got himself into a pot of lukewarm water. And eventually, as it got hotter and hotter, he was too late and unable to escape. Remember, we talked about that pot of hot water was the fact that he married 700 women and had 300 concubines. Now, this may have seemed wise in his day and age because he had all of these political alliances. He had made peace with kingdom after kingdom after kingdom by marrying into the royal families of the kingdoms around them. But here was the problem. These women, foreign women, came with foreign gods and were allowed to continue worshiping their foreign gods even inside of the nation of Israel. And then they took it a step further. They asked Solomon and he granted them the access to and the permission to begin worshiping their gods in temples that he built for them inside of the capital of Jerusalem. So now open idolatry is taking place again, once again in God's nation, Israel. And remember the first commandment, not not down the list, number one, at the top of the list, God had said, you shall have no other gods before me. And right off the top, they begin once again disobeying that commandment. So God comes to Solomon and gives him a message. 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So the key to understanding this text is right at the beginning. It says Solomon's heart had turned away from the Lord. And I want this as a key principle from the story, a key plot point, and your first fill in the blank if you're a note taker is this. Getting your focus off of God is the root cause of sin. Getting your focus off of God, turning your focus, your desire, your attention towards anything that's not God is the pathway that leads you to this place of sin. But I love that the flip side of this is also true. That if we focus on God, that's the root cause of blessing. Focusing on God, turning our attention, our life, our desires towards God is the path of blessing. So this is how that works in regular everyday life. Do you want to be a better dad? Anyone wants to be a better dad? I do. The way we become a better dad is by focusing our heart, our desire, our life towards the Lord. Want to be a better mom, a better wife, a better friend, a better worker? You want to be better at managing your finances? You put anything in this box, and I promise you, first and foremost, the way in which we obtain this is by seeking the Lord first. 
Jesus said it like this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. See, this is a key understanding of God. When we turn our focus on ourself, on our own desires, on our own passions, on other people, on governments, on any other thing, it's going to lead us down a path that can never satisfy the place of sin. We only can find the blessing by focusing on the Lord. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom, lost sight of this. See, he lost sight of the very most important thing in, the, in our world. The very most important thing that we have is our relationship to God himself. This is what set David, his father, apart. Remember, David was a flawed individual. He sinned big time, but what made David different is that he loved and pursued God first and foremost. All through his life, even when he messed up, he continued relentlessly to pursue after God. But Solomon didn't pursue after God. In fact, it says his heart turned away from the Lord. Solomon began to trust and pursue his own accomplishments, his own wisdom, his own wealth, his own pleasure. But at the end of his life, you actually get to know how all of it turned out because he writes for us a book of wisdom. And in his book of wisdom, he tells us the value of all of his accomplishments, all of his wealth, all of his pleasure, and all of his wisdom. It's uh, pretty uh, exciting stuff. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2. You guys like this. <clears throat> meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He sounds like an optimistic guy, doesn't he? Real fun at a party. What Solomon came to realize is this, friends, that all the pleasure on the earth, and guess what? Solomon experienced all of it. All the wealth on the earth. Guess what? Read it. He experienced all of it. All of this experience could not satisfy him. None of it could. And so what we have, I love, this is Ecclesiastes 1-2. This is the start of the book. Starts like this. Here's the last verse of the book. Here's how the verse comes. Here's how the book ends. Here's the conclusion that Solomon comes to at the end. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Now, all has been heard. Speaking about everything that he's spoken here. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands. This is the duty of mankind. That's the end of the book. The wisest man who ever lived or ever will live boils down life for you and I to understand the big questions in life. Anyone ever ask these, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of my life? Humanity has been asking these questions from the very beginning. And what Solomon says is, here it is, friends, I'm going to give it to you. Fear God. That means to honor him, to stand in awe of him, to love him, to respect him, to pay attention to him. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, remember, Jesus provided for us commentary about what these commandments are all about. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So let me boil this down. I've got some good news for you. If you've ever questioned what's the meaning in life or what's the purpose of my life, I'm going to tell you today. That's good news, right? You came to the right place. Here it is. Then you can write it down. The purpose of your life is this, to love God and love people. Love God and love people. That's it, friends. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom, had lost sight of this. And he allowed the worship of these foreign gods. And he actually, a prophet named Ahijah, was sent by God to a rising star in Solomon's administration, a man named Jeroboam. And he told Jeroboam a, a wild thing. He tells Jeroboam, you're going to be the future king of Israel, not Solomon's son. But he says, but not all of Israel. I'm going to save one tribe for Israel, and you will rule over the rest. So Solomon decides he's going to kill Jeroboam, because Jeroboam 
does what I would probably do and decides, well, if God says this, then I'm just going to make it happen. And he tries it too early. Solomon's still alive, which is a big mistake. So he ends up having to leave to exile to Egypt where he lives and waits to hear word that Solomon has died. Well, eventually Solomon does die. And after Solomon's death, his own tribe, remember, he's from the tribe of Judah, David's tribe. Solomon decide, uh, Solomon's tribe, Judah, crowns his son, Rehoboam, as the next king of Israel. But there's a problem. Most of the population isn't happy about this decision, especially the northern tribes, because they've grown to resent Solomon's leadership. We find out from the Bible that Solomon taxed his people heavily and required them to do manual labor to accomplish all of these grand building projects that he had undertaken. And the people are sick of it. So Jeroboam in Egypt hears that Rehoboam has been made king and he heads back from Egypt to the coronation to lead the people to ask a few questions of the newly crowned king. When they show up, they say, are you going to be like your dad or will you lift some of this tax and burden off of the back of your people? Rehoboam says, give me three days and I'll decide. So they all go home and in the meantime, Rehoboam goes first to Solomon's advisors, his father's advisors, the elders. He sits down with them and he asks them what he should do. And here's their response. 1 Kings 12, 7. If you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servant. But Rehoboam rejects their advice and goes instead to some young guys he grew up with. 1 Kings 12, 10 through 12. The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist, and my father laid on you a heavy yoke. I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. This is terrible advice. I want to give you an important thing. It's not one of your plot points to write down, but it's something for you to consider. Wise people surround themselves with wise counsel. And Solomon, the wisest guy who ever lived, had surrounded himself with wisdom. But the flip side of this is also true. Foolish people surround themselves with foolish counsel. So there's an uncomfortable litmus test for us, friends. Who do we have speaking into our lives? Who have we encouraged and allowed to speak into our lives? And if you look around and think, who is allowed to speak into my life? If the answer is no one, or you look at the people and you think, Ugh, then we need to do some work in this area. Because wisdom means we surround ourselves with godly people who can speak wisdom. It's why the church and small group and all of this matters, because we need to invite other people to share into our lives. This is terrible advice that he gets. And when you read it this week in your homework, you're actually going to see when he goes and gives the speech in three days, they show up, they say, so what's your answer? He quotes these not-so-smart guys word for word. He actually tells the people, I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. You think, oh, no. So you know what happens is they revolt. The people are not willing to accept another tyrannical leader, and so the tribes are divided. Ten tribes form a new kingdom, and this is where it gets a little confusing. The new kingdom made up of the ten northern tribes is called Israel. Now that's confusing because the whole nation used to be called Israel, but now there's a new nation called Israel, but it's not the same one. It's just ten of the twelve tribes. And two tribes, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, form a new nation in the south called Judah which used to just be a tribe name, but now is the name of a nation. A northern kingdom, Israel. A southern kingdom, Judah. And this division happens in 930 BC. I actually have a timeline for you, and what you'll see is on the blue, which we moved from the creation, the fall, the flood of Babel, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Solomon, David, Saul, David, Solomon, and now the kingdom is going to divide in 930, and it's going to stay divided from this point forward. Friends, 
Division is a terrible, nasty, awful place to live. And the fruit of this division is poisonous to the people. Jesus said it like this in Luke eleven seventeen: 17. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln famously quoted this in a speech about the abolishment of slavery. And the idea in the Bible is a house can be a family. A house can be an individual. A house can be a church. A house can be a business. A house can actually be an entire nation. And But what it's saying is there's a lot of outside forces that are constantly warring against our houses all the time to break apart the unity of our house. And the thing we must do, church, as the people of God, as families of God, as Christian business owners, whatever it may be, is we must protect the unity inside the house. Because if the house becomes divided, it will not stand. It's why the devil likes to immediately pick people apart and break apart unity. Because unity is a powerful weapon that God will use to accomplish his purposes. And disunity, on the other hand, will divide and break a family or a house or a church apart. And that's exactly what we see happen next. The nation is plunged into a long terrible, bloody civil war. And the new king of the north, Jeroboam, now sets up a new capital city in a place called Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and makes a new capital city there. But he has a major problem. The religious center, the center of Jewish life and practice is in the southern kingdom of Judah in the city called Jerusalem, where the temple that Solomon built is. All the festivals, all the worship, the altar, sacrifice, all of that is happening in the south. So what will the northern king do? Well, he comes up with a plan. 1 Kings 12, 26 through 33. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go and offer their sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They'll kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So after seeking advice, again bad advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, so here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up at Bethel, and the other at Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel, and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests for all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places that he had made. On the 15th day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifice on the altar that he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival of the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. This is bad. Really bad. So God, in his mercy, sends a prophet to warn the new king Jeroboam and actually pronounce judgment against this altar that they've set up there at Bethel. And while he's prophesying and speaking to them, the altar splits in two in this amazing move of God's power. So you think, well, clearly, with this kind of move of power, the people will repent. 1 Kings 13, 4-6. When King Jeroboam heard that the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord, and the king's hand was restored, and it became as it was before. So you would think, okay, now clearly they're going to return to the Lord. Another display of his power, another display of his might, but that's not the way the story goes. 
They will continue in the northern kingdom down the path of darkness. They will continue unrepentant, living in their evil ways. And things will go from bad to a lot, lot worse. Kings come and kings go in the north, and they continue to move only in one direction, down. In the south, they're playing the teeter-totter game. Remember the book of Judges where they do good, and then they'd fall away, and they'd do good, and they'd fall away? This is what's happening in the southern kingdom. A good king, a godly king, followed by a wicked king, followed by a wicked king, followed by a good king, and this thing keeps going for a while until ultimately it's only going in one direction too. But we're focusing right now in the north where things have really gotten out of control. 1 Kings chapter 16, 29 through 33. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. 1 Kings 21, 25 through 26. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Urged on by Jezebel, his wife, he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. So what started in Israel under their first new king is the worship of these golden calves, just like their ancestors, by the way, on Mount Sinai. Remember, Moses is up on the mountain, they're building calves, because calves are what they had in Egypt, so it's what they're familiar with. So they begin to build that thing that they're familiar with. Well, once again, the institute, the worship of the golden calves, and now, just a few generations later, the worship of golden calves has become the worship of Baal. Maybe that's not that big a deal to you because you don't understand who Baal is. Maybe you're more familiar with Baal by his Philistine name, Baal Zebub. That's the name that the Pharisees accused Jesus of being. Because he has the ability to cast demons out, they say, maybe you are Beelzebub, the Lord or master of the demons, and that's where you get your power from. Friends, Baal in the ancient world is the name for Satan himself. And the people of God are now openly worshiping Satan. In their temples, they teach that this fallen angel, this fallen son of God, actually led a revolt because of God's injustice using thunder and lightning, defeated the armies of God and was cast down to earth, not as a loser, but as the victor who claimed his prize of earth. Now that's some PR spin right there. And now they're openly worshiping the god Baal. I want to show you another important plot point. Because this is what we see happening over and over when it comes to sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. Satan had lured the nation of Israel one step at a time, deeper and deeper and deeper. Systematically, just like the frog in the pan, he had turned up the heat and turned up the heat and turned up the heat until now they are openly worshiping Baal. But God was not done with his people. God sends them a new prophet, this one a man named Elijah, who's going to come to Ahab with the message in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain 
in the next few years except by my word. And God causes a drought which causes a famine to sweep over the northern king of Israel, the northern kingdom. Elijah is taken to a place next to a brook where God supernaturally provides for him food that comes by birds every single day, sort of like God provided using the birds and using the manna in the desert for his people. He provides for Elijah until one day the brook goes dry. When the brook goes dry, God says, get up, I'm sending you to a widow's house. He gets to the widow's house and the widow only has a tiny bit of oil and a tiny bit of flour, but after making him bread and sacrificing on his behalf, God does a miracle where every single day she's able to keep making the bread and year after year goes by and her provision never runs out. And then when her son gets sick and dies, God uses Elijah to raise him from the dead. And now we're told in the story that three years pass during this time period. And we get to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And it says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. So Elijah obeys. He's going to go and speak to Ahab. And so now, friends, buckle up, because here we go. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 through 46. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, this is King Ahab, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Just so you know, Asherah is Baal's wife. She's the female, feminine version of Baal, the goddess of fertility in their belief system. So he's got both the prophets. It's going to be 850 prophets versus one prophet of the Lord. Verse 20. So Ahab went, so Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between the two options? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Does this sound familiar? Do you remember Joshua's speech? Joshua stood on, that, on a mountain before the people of Israel at the end of the conquest of the promised land and said, Choose today whom you will serve, whether you'll serve the gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites, or if you'll choose to serve the Lord. And do you remember what happened when he said that? The people cried out, we choose to serve the Lord. And just to make sure they got it, he says it again, choose who you'll serve. They, oh no, we choose to serve the Lord. Three times they repeat themselves that they will serve the Lord. And then they set up rocks and he says, these rocks are witnesses. Right here, to what you said today. But look at what happens this time. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and I'll put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. And the people said, what you say is good. See, they love this idea, a competition between the gods. Remember, in their belief system and in their stories, they already believed that Baal defeated Yahweh in heaven in open battle, that he's a victorious God. So they've got no problem with this competition whatsoever. Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. 
since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. I love this part of the story. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep in thought or, or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. Remember, Satan's goal is to always kill and destroy. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice came. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sheahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and you have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. So, the winner of this little contest is fairly clear to see. God would not allow his people to turn to idolatry without a fight. God continued to relentlessly pursue after his people. And friends, this is still true to this day. And it's an important plot point for you and I. God relentlessly pursues his people. He relentlessly pursues his people, and he will use whatever it takes to get our attention and build, bring us back into relationship with him. I believe there was a reason that these prophets of Baal continued crying out, continued cutting themselves, continued believing that something was going to happen. I believe they had seen things happen before and that this wasn't just blind faith, but they had practiced this religion and they believed something was going to happen and God said, uh-uh, I'm not letting it happen today. And he let them go on and on and on. Why? He made it clear to his people that he alone was the Lord. That he alone was God. So let's see what happens next. Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. I want you to notice this posture he takes. It's different from what we just saw. He gets himself into a posture of prayer, into a posture of humility, and he begins to pray. And as he prays, verse 43, he sends his servant. It says, go and look toward the sea, the Mediterranean. He told his servant, and he went up and looked. 
He says, there's nothing. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. Do you see what's happening? Elijah is praying. Elijah is in a position of humility, and he's praying, asking the Lord to send rain. And he continues to persevere. Each time the servant comes back, says nothing yet. He prays. He sends him out again. He prays. He sends him out again. He prays seven times. Verse 44, the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell Ahab. Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and he tucked in his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Seven times, Elijah sent his servant toward the Mediterranean Sea. Report any indication that you see a storm gathering. Six of those times he came back and said nothing, but the prophet Elijah continued to pray. And the seventh time, I love it, says they saw a small cloud, the size of a hand, a small, that was enough. As soon as he heard it, as soon as he saw it, he said, now go and tell him, the rain's coming. And then the rain began to gather up. Friends, here's an incredibly important plot point for you once again. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We actually have commentary written about this story by James, the leader of the New Testament church in Jerusalem. James writes about this uh, experience for Elijah, and he tells us this. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. At the beginning of this service, when we prayed for the nation of Ukraine, prayer is not a platitude. Prayer is not something that we do when we don't know what else to do. Prayer is the way that God changes the world. God's people in faith praying is the way God has chosen to work in this world. I don't know why he chose this. I don't know why this is the way he does things. But it's clear throughout Scripture that he uses us. He uses our prayers to change nations, to change people, to change families, to bring healing to the sick. So friends, will we be a people, a church, who truly believe God and who pray? Or do we just say, oh, I'll pray for you as a nice thing, a nice way of saying, I don't know what else to do, so I'll pray. No, I know exactly what I should do. I should pray. Because that's powerful and that's effective. Now, I wish I could tell you that Israel, at this amazing display of God's power, they put the prophets to death, the rain comes. You have to think they're just on a high, a real high here. I mean, literally a Mount Carmel mountaintop high experience. I wish I could tell you that they repented, they turned back to the Lord. They stopped seeking after idols, and the rest of their life was great. But that's not the way the story goes. When the king gets back home, he tells his wife Jezebel about what happened on the mountain. And she's not happy. In fact, it says that she sends out word that, Elijah, you're going to be dead before the sun sets. Now, Elijah just called down fire from heaven. Elijah just prayed and rain came for the first time in three and a half years. So we would like to assume that Elijah, after his mountaintop experience, is going to say, bring it on, Jezebel. But that's not what happens either. In fact, we're told in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3 and 4, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. You see, Elijah 
is infected by the same virus called sin that's plagued every single character in the story up until this point. And here's the thing we realize, no matter how high our highs are, no matter what our mountaintop experiences with God may look like, we still have a problem. We still have this issue of sin. We still have this issue of fear. We still have these issues that even Elijah, the prophet who could call down fire, is going to continue to struggle with. But God is relentless in his pursuit. He will not let Elijah go. He comes to him three times. Get up, Elijah. Eat something. Come on. Get up, Elijah. Come on. Get up, Elijah, three times. And then he leads Elijah to a place where Elijah is going to have an amazing experience with the presence of God. Transformative experience with God's presence. God just won't give up on his people. He still will not give up on his people. He sends Elijah. After that, he sends Elisha. That's a confusing one. We get those stories mixed up a lot. Jonah's going to come, Micah's going to come, Amos is going to come, Hosea is going to come. When you read that one this week, Hosea had a rough lot. God had him marry a prostitute to show him exactly how the nation of Israel had treated God as husband. He's going to send Isaiah, the great prophet, who's going to write all about the coming Messiah, He's going to send these prophets over and over and over. Why? Because he won't give up. He will not give up on his people. He wants them to turn away. He wants them to turn back. He wants them to repent. He wants them to learn. He wants them to grow. He wants them to trust. And time and time again, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are going to make a choice to follow after themselves. Band, you can come back up. To follow after their own ways to follow after their own understanding, to follow after their own plan. And friends, instead of us looking today at Israel and being like, those idiots, I can't believe they did that. Man, time and time again, can you believe reading the story just how many times they messed things up? If that's the way you're reading the story, you're doing it wrong. Because see, here's the truth, friends. We have the Word of God. And we have something unique. We have the Spirit of God. We're filled both by His given His Word and His Spirit and have had God revealed to us through Jesus. And how often do we still make the same choice to trust ourselves, to trust our own understanding, to follow after our own desires, to follow after our own pursuits, and to set up and worship our own idols in our lives? Friends, we can easily read these things and think, man, I can't believe they did that instead of recognizing and looking at our own habits and our own life and our own tendencies to be led astray. The Bible says we like sheep, we like to go astray. But here's the good news. We have a shepherd who will not give up on us, who just keeps coming after us.